Welcome back to Mega Mechatronics. This is part two of the Twin Charging 101 series. If you haven't checked out part one, you should definitely check out part one. If you're experienced, you need to confirm your beliefs. If you're inexperienced, it's a requirement. So let's take the analogy of the seed of knowledge. So part one, we're laying roots. And then in part two, in this video, we're gonna sprout, start sprouting this idea of twin charging. And as we get into it, we'll get deeper and deeper and grow this knowledge. As some of you know, and a lot of you don't know, it takes a lot of time and effort to produce these videos, to do all the research, double checking your knowledge, and then trying to convey that, trying to communicate that. And I use PowerPoint, and that takes some time to build these presentations, these high level presentations with the animations. A lot goes into it. You might not know it until you actually do it. So I would really appreciate it if you at least hit that like button. And also, if you want to continue to see this series, don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell. Well, here we go. Mega Mechatronics. Now we're going to get into the nitty gritty of twin chargers. And we're going to look at all these airflow magnification devices and systems. I'm calling the this weird name because I'm trying to be careful about using certain words that might trigger people. So this is sort of the catch-all term. We're going to use a device to magnify the airflow in our engines. Okay, that covers basically everything that would boost every forced induction piece of equipment. And again, this is for internal combustion engines. So our first type of airflow magnification device would be the centrifugal air compressor. It uses impeller geometry to induce kinetic energy and accelerate the air. So it's inducing energy into the air, accelerating it. And it could be driven in several ways. We'll look at those. And the flow rate is nonlinear with relation to the impeller speed. So as the impeller speed increases, airflow increases exponentially. So we'll try to take a look at an example here. We have a lacrosse player here about to send the lacrosse ball through someone's face right here. We'll zoom in here. And this guy, look at his facial expressions. Oh my goodness. Okay, so this he's, he's going to pivot around his elbow and shoulder here. And we're, we'll skip ahead. Let's look at this. Let's say we shortened his stick. That's going to fly a, a lot slower, right? If he had a short, stubby stick like this, that lacrosse ball would not have the same velocity as if he used the longer stick. So this will be kind of, this is sort of the primer for when we look at the centrifugal air compressor a little closer. And the other type the completely different type of airflow magnification device we use with internal combustion engines is the positive displacement pump. Each revolution of this type of positive displacement pump, each revolution pumps a fixed amount of air. Okay, if we look at the centrifugal air compressor, where's, there's no fixed amount of air. It's, it's accelerating air and flinging it. So in the positive displacement case, we are containing and moving a fixed amount of air every time it rotates. And these are typically mechanically driven. You know, belt or gear is going to be 99% for automotive applications. And also, the flow rate is linear with relation to rotor speed. So these are fixed displacement pumps. To give you an example about, you know, for touching on fixed displacement, so every time this hydraulic cylinder cycles, the same exact amount of fluid is going to go in and the same amount of fluid is going to come out. It's fixed. And again, looking at this squirt gun, you can see he has it in the filled position. So the piston is fully extended. And then when he squirts somebody, he reduces the volume inside that chamber, increases pressure, and then it forces that water out of the thing. And when he goes to fill it, He's going to fill it up with the same exact amount of water every time he cycles that. It's a fixed displacement. Okay, so let, let's get into detail with the centrifugal superchargers. 
So with the tip of a rotating object, the tip is always moving the fastest, right? A rotating object, anything, the outer limit or the tip of it is going to be moving the fastest. So we have our impeller blades here, those kind of curved blades represent the impeller. So at the tip of the impeller, it's moving the fastest. And at the base of the impeller blade, it is moving the slowest. Radial speed here. So radial speed will increase linearly outward from the center. So as we move farther out, the, the speed is going to increase. Low velocity air enters at the center and is then accelerated by the blade. So the air is going slow, has a low velocity, and then with centrifugal forces, the air is uh, forced to the outside. And the air pressure against the housing is increased, is high. So the air is being pushed against the housing until it reaches the outlet pipe, where the, the pressure is lower on the discharge side. So you remember, air flows from the higher pressure area to the lower pressure area, same concept here. And these are quite efficient, you know. You're not going to use a box fan to create pressure because the box fan has horrible tolerances or those silly eBay superchargers. They're horrible. So the properly designed centrifugal superchargers are efficient because of the tight tolerances between the impeller and the housing. So we'll look at the different types of centrifugal superchargers. Here's one that's driven by the exhaust. So it uses waste energy recovery and is driven by the exhaust. The impeller is driven by uh, exhaust energy. And then in this next case, same thing. It's a centrifugal supercharger, but it's driven mechanically. And these are easy to integrate into vehicles and to places uh, that, that don't have a lot of room for piping and all that. Um, and uh, disadvantages, they, they do take energy they do take torque away from your crank and reduce your output but it's a case of four steps forward and two steps back you're still making out on top and a lot of racers will prove that this is a winning device and the last method to drive a centrifugal supercharger is of course electrical an electric motor and these are coming out there they are available um, but to get real high horsepower, we're going to have to use high voltage. And this is still being developed, but it's using a centrifugal supercharger. So this is one sign that an electric supercharger is legitimate, is if they're using this type of compressor. So now we're going to look at positive displacement superchargers. These are the fixed flow pumps. So here is a roots style, straight lobe style example. So this is a cutaway of the two lobes meshing. So these are spinning this way. In the other type, the screw type, it's going to spin the other way. But let's focus on the roots, traditional roots style, probably the most, um, most popular and le least expensive type of positive displacement supercharger. Okay, so the rotors are spinning this way. Okay, so let's figure out fixed volume. Where's this fixed volume coming from? The fixed volume is coming from that space between the that lobe. So the lobe is traced in the black and the housing will be the red line. So it's that fixed volume between that cavity that the lobe that the rotor makes and the housing. So you see there's fixed volume over here in fixed volume over here. Okay, so we're, we're sealing that air in that cavity and then moving it. Okay, so now you're wondering, doesn't it flow back? Can it flow backwards? How does that work? Well, look at this super low clearance gap here where the rotors mesh. So as as those rotors are, are meshing, it's, it's sealing, doing a very good job of sealing the air on the air outlet side. So a fixed volume of air is conveyed each revolution. It's not compressed in this root style. It's conveyed. 
the air is moved, transported. So these are usually always mechanically driven. That means they are parasitic losses. They're taking torque away from your crankshaft. They're, they're robbing horsepower. But again, it, it's three steps forward, one steps back, or, you know, depending on the efficiencies, five steps forward, you know, four steps back type of idea here. So just a reminder, you see how much information there is out there and how much you need to explain. So please right now hit that like button, hit that thumbs up. Thank you so much. Here is the traditional root style, the first style here with the straight lobe. And they are not only for automotive, they can be found in industrial applications. And probably the most popular would be something like this. Dom's yes! charger. He's running a 971 root style positive displacement supercharger on his race car here. And then our next style is a root, but with a twist. The rotors spin the same direction as the traditional straight lobed roots, but it has a 60 degree twist and it makes it a little bit more efficient. So that could be something like an M62. So this is an Eaton M62, but there are several other manufacturers out there. But that happens to be the one I'm using on um, the uh, Superbo Twin Charge Solstice I'm building. And finally, we have the screw type twin screw. Eaton TVS is the example. Again, we're, we're using automotive examples. I understand there are different industrial applications that perform differently, have different characteristics, but we're looking at automotive here. So this is the Eaton TVS Twin Vortices, uh, and this has a very aggressive 160 degree twisted lobe and the rotors actually spin the other direction. Essentially it's a positive displacement supercharger. Okay, let's take a look at semantics and clear up any confusion about the words that we're going to be using in the future here. So when we say turbo, we mean turbocharger, which is an exhaust driven centrifugal compressor. Then if we say centrifugal, that means a mechanically driven centrifugal compressor. You're probably wondering, this is crazy. Well, these are sort of the well-known kind of industry names or what people use to describe these different devices. Even though they all use the same type of compressor, the, the centrifugal is typically associated with a mechanically driven centrifugal compressor as the one you can see in the picture. But this is the electrically driven centrifugal compressor. And then blower. A blower is going to be any type of positive displacement. So the screws, roots, rotary, and other styles. Finally, we have our nitrous. You know, one or more stages of N2O injection. What is nitrous? Nitrous is two molecules of nitrogen connected to one molecule of oxygen. So what happens is at high temperatures during combustion, the oxygen breaks away from the nitrogen. And this is our boom juice. This is our oxidizer, which can help us burn more fuel per combustion cycle. And now we get to the big question. What is twin charging? It seems like there's a lot of opinions and the community can benefit from your knowledge so please in the comments provide some insight provide references or give us some you know of your anecdotal experiences explain the reasoning for your answers don't just give three word answers come on let's clarify this this is a interesting topic in 2020 there's not a ton of stuff out there so what is twin charging I'm going to break this into do two different definitions. Quantitative, so quantitative will be focusing on the actual hardware, the actual device, the physical things. And then a qualitative definition, which goes a little deeper and looks at, you know, reasoning and why and and the 
and benefits and in a benefit analysis. So quantitatively, you're thinking a turbo and a blower. You're thinking an, an exhaust driven centrifugal compressor, which is a turbocharger and a positive displacement supercharger or blower. The problem is not everyone agrees. So if you start doing research, if you read more than one article, you're going to start running across contradicting information. So that brings us to our qualitative answer. The qualitative answer will be driven by the question, why twin charge an engine? And just to warn you, this is going to be my opinion. So let's do our qualitative analysis of what is twin charging. And we're going to go back and we're going to look at what the roots are. Where did twin charging come from? And our best understanding and, and someone implementing it at a high level, at least, it's totally possible an unsung hero had come up with this idea and, and used it. But the this this group here brought it to Earth, brought it to the mainstream. And that's the Lancia Delta S4 Group B rally car. That's it. I'll just plug this. I don't know Garage Dreams, but I came across his channel. Looks like it's a small channel, but he put a lot of work into this video, so I appreciated that. So that's why I shared it here. And you'll find that this vehicle is twin charged. They used a turbo and a blower, an exhaust driven compressor, and the positive displacement supercharger. It was built by Abarth and Martini Racing. And it produced 400 to 550 horsepower race prepped. But there are rumors that they tuned it to 800 or 1,000 horsepower. A couple different sources said those numbers. And there is an unfortunate story associated with this car. And there, there were uh, twin charge vehicles after this. But with this vehicle in particular, during a race, the, the car was involved with a wreck and both of the drivers passed away. So we should take a moment to recognize these two gentlemen, these two daredevils and give them a moment of silence. All right, so let's get back on track here. We're going to look at Mega Man's proposed definition to describe a twin charge engine. Again, this is my opinion. This is my proposed definition. An internal combustion engine must meet the following requirements to be considered twin charged. The first requirement is that it uses two airflow magnification devices and systems. So two of those air those those superchargers, positive displacement or centrifugal superchargers. It uses two of those. The second requirement is that each device or system here compensates for characteristic deficiencies in the other system or device. So we have two of these devices. Each of them compensates for characteristic deficiencies that the other has. Okay, so we're going to go back to the Delta S4 and let's look at what Abarth and Martini were, were doing here. They noted that the turbo exhaust driven centrifugal compressor, the turbo had excellent top end, had, had good top end, but the low end was horrible. And remember this was eighties technology. So great top end, great high horsepower, great peak, horsepower but laggy and they also noted or they also knew that the positive displacement superchargers had excellent low end they had good low end but the bad characteristic was it had a horrible top end or very inefficient top end 
uh, peak horsepower. So what, what they did was they combined good top end with the good low end. They're forced twin charged. Okay, let's see if this passes the acid test. Does the Lancia DS4 have two airflow magnification devices or systems? Yes, it does. It has a turbo and a supercharger. Or turbo and a blower. Second test here. D does each device on the Lancia DS4 compensate for characteristic deficiency? Yes, I just pointed it out. Look at the crossed out red Yes, and the two greens. Of course, this passes the test. This vehicle is twin charged, in Mega Man's opinion. Now let's touch this topic. Wow, I put a lot of thought into this, so you have to give me an opportunity to, to show you my logic and reasoning by this. So please, pay attention. Okay, the Earth's atmosphere contains... About 80% nitrogen, 20% oxygen. Let's just make it simple. And remember that definition earlier? Boosting an engine with a centrifugal or positive displacement air pump will result in more oxygen available for combustion, increasing fuel consumption, releasing more energy, creating more torque. Okay, everyone agrees. Yes? If you don't agree, put it down in the comments. Please, you need to expose yourself. Okay, let's look at the Earth's atmosphere. Again, it has eight parts of nitrogen, two parts of oxygen. So this kind of represents the atmosphere and the ratios, just to simplify it. So we got a little bit more nitrogen than oxygen. Now let's look at nitrous oxide. So nitrous oxide provides more oxygen available for combustion, increasing fuel consumption, releasing more energy, creating more torque. Does that sound familiar to anyone? Yes. Let's look at what's in a bottle of nitrous. We got N2O. We have nitrogen and we have oxygen. So at high temperatures, at combustion temperatures, the oxygen breaks away. Okay, so hear me out. So we're taking Earth's atmosphere and shoving it into an engine to get more oxygen, to, to shove more red circles into the combustion chamber to, to uh, oxidize with the fuel, to make more power. How is that different with nitrous oxide? Nitrous oxide, we're injecting oxygen. On, no different than, the, than what the Earth's atmosphere contains. Pretty much. It's the same makeup, just different types of bonds here. What do you think? By boosting or using force induction, we're shoving more red circles, more of those oxygens into the combustion chamber. With nitrous oxide, we're shoving more of the red circles, more of the oxygen, oxygen into the combustion chamber. Do you see where I'm going with this? Please leave a comment below if you agree or disagree. That was part two, I hope you enjoyed. Please hit the thumbs up button. If you wanna see more, hit that subscribe and that bell. In the next videos, I hope to start getting into the build of the car and finish the science portion, and we start showing you how to build a twin charger. So again, don't forget to subscribe, and I'll see you next time. Thanks.